Yeah, it's Blendo with another banger. In this video, we're gonna break down the paperwork of NBA Youngboy's latest arrest. And we're gonna talk about the details that many people are overlooking as they report the fraud operation that Youngboy was allegedly running to obtain his lien. Youngboy was on house arrest for a federal weapons charge out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this recent arrest only further complicates his legal situation. But the paperwork reveals that they're investigating his activities across several states. The paperwork also reveals that the feds plan to use lyrics against Youngboy as they portray a narrative of a violent empire being ran by NBA Youngboy. And they also talk about a minor picking up a prescription for Youngboy. Alright, let's dive into the paperwork. On the first page, we can see that the first charge is possession of a dangerous weapon by restricted. That's short by a restricted person. Youngboy is a convicted felon. He's not allowed to possess weapons. And on top of that, we can see that this may have additional repercussions as the judge told him that on his conditions for his pretrial release on house arrest, he cannot handle weapons or possess them. The next charge is a pattern of unlawful activity, which means they have enough evidence to prove that young boy is organizing this crime in a pattern and it is not sporadic. They're gonna follow up with several consecutive charges of identity fraud with value under $5,000. The paperwork would reveal that young boy had loosely organized his operation to obtain the promethazine with codeine syrup but only with one week's supply at a time. So each count being under $5,000 does lessen the impact and the severity of all these charges. I know many young boy fans are very worried right now about the 63 charges, but remember that every instance of him going to the pharmacy or sending someone to the pharmacy under false pretense with false information triples up on the charges because he gets one charge of identity fraud and then two more charges in addition one for the illegal prescription and then for using the illegal information from the doctors now that we're on the second page we can see that the charges just keep stacking but they are just repetitive as we proceed to the third page we can see the charges keep stacking and they include forgery and possession of marijuana and we see that the heart of this affidavit becomes clear what they're attempting to paint young boy as let's dive in and zoom in it begins saying there's probable cause to charge young boy with these charges because he's been a target of an investigation by the cash county sheriff's office after being identified as a suspect in the large-scale prescription fraud ring the prescription fraud ring is known to have attempted or has acquired various prescription medications, specifically promethazine with codeine, a cough suppressant that's heavily abused, Schedule 5 controlled substance from multiple pharmacies in Cash County. The document also says that the operation stems across the state of Utah. It also says that individuals associated with a young boy have been arrested in association with the fraud incident at one of the pharmacies in Smithfield and the events are described in the paperwork. The paperwork begins to describe the operation where young boy would call Lynn under a fake name. For example, on September 19th of 2023, he called in saying he was Bethel White using a fake date of birth and he called in for a prescription using a legitimate DEA number and NPI number from a physician in Provo, Utah. The pharmacy discovered that the phone number that the suspect called in from did not match the phone number of the clinic in the Provo area. Let's not overlook the detail that young boy was using legitimate NPI and DEA numbers or national provider identifier and drug enforcement agency numbers to order these prescriptions. At this point, it remains unclear how young boy got a hold of this information. But as we continue with the affidavit, it says that the pharmacy would contact the doctor's office in Provo and they would confirm they did not have a patient 
by the name of Bethel White, nor did they call in a prescription to their pharmacy. As we begin the top of the fourth page, we can see that the physician actually spoke to the pharmacy and said that it's happened several times today. And they also called in an antibiotic as well, along with the permethazine with the codeine. Law enforcement showed up to the parking lot of the Reed's pharmacy, waiting for someone to show up for the prescription, but no suspect showed up. Another pharmacy called Spence's Pharmacy in Logan, Utah, received a phone call from the suspect using the same information from the physician and then saying his name was Gwendolyn Cox with a fake date of birth and the prescription for permethazine with codeine. It was similar to the prescription ordered at Reed's Pharmacy. A female suspect described as Associate 2 in the paperwork picked up the prescription two weeks after the phone call was made and then on October 9th the next month Spence's Pharmacy will receive another call from Gwendolyn Cox asking for another bottle of promethazine with codeine. But then the pharmacist asked the physician to send a hard copy of the prescription, which then caused the caller to hang up. After the caller dropped the call, the pharmacist would call the physician and he would confirm that he did not order that prescription and that his credentials and his name were being used fraudulently. We also see they wrote, it's also of value to note that the home address given to the pharmacy for Gwendolyn was a local address in Logan, Utah. As we proceed down the page, we can see that they called another pharmacy called Larry's Pharmacy in the Smithfield area. And the prescription had been called in by someone saying they were Gwendolyn Cox again with a slightly different spelling. The prescription again was for permethazine with codeine. The pharmacist said that the call was suspicious. The pharmacy will go ahead and call the doctor by looking up the phone number. And they got a different phone number than the one that they got the call from. And they will confirm during the conversation with the physician that he does not have a patient called Gwendolyn Cox. After speaking to the physician, the pharmacy will call the police and they would tell law enforcement the details of these suspicious calls and they would also inform them that a suspicious person claiming to be a grandchild of Gwendolyn Cox was the one assisting in this scheme. They mentioned the caller sounded much younger than the date of birth described under the prescription. As we proceed along page 4, we see more shocking details as a special agent from the Cash Rich Drug Task Force was conducting an investigation. He was noticing similarities between the information received from Larry's and the information received from Spence's pharmacy. And he devised a plan to contact the person that was trying to pick up the prescriptions from Larry's pharmacy. These two female associates of Cantrell Golden, aka NBA Youngboy, were detained by the special agent for the investigation of the prescription fraud ring. We can see the document further describe another incident where the special agent was contacted by dispatch and informed of Gwendolyn Cox that needed to speak to him. The agent would get the phone number and then he would speak to Gwendolyn Cox, which the paperwork heavily indicates that was young boy. When he spoke to him, he noted that when he asked for his name, when he spelled the last name, he spelled out white instead of Cox. And then also, when he asked for his date of birth, he could not provide the exact date, only the birth month. The document would state that the agent would pick up on the accent of the caller, which was young boy southern accent from Louisiana, when he said, well I asked her to, and she said that she'll have you call me. The statement was a response to a request that was made to have Gwendolyn contact dispatch and have them transfer her call back through. So this indicates that they could tell that it was young boy faking a voice on the phone. The document will give more details about the incident when the two suspects known as Associate 1 and 2 were apprehended at Larry's pharmacy. They were pulled over in a white Tahoe that was registered to young boy out of Texas. The police would smell marijuana and a search was conducted and then they were able to find some residue of marijuana flakes. And they also found the case of a Tiza 1911 pistol and a 45 caliber. 
The two suspects would insist that they were picking up a prescription for a friend, but they would not give up a name. But when they were separated, one of the females said the prescription was for Deborah Cox. The police ended up taking the vehicle to impound after being suspicious that it was stolen. An individual claiming to be Youngboy's business manager would contact the impound lot and he would say that he was trying to get the vehicle back. They got suspicious, so they contacted the police. We now move on to the center of page 5, where we discuss some explosive details that many people are overlooking, where Youngboy may have self-incriminated himself very severely. We read here in the center of page 5 that Youngboy spoke to the police, giving them permission to take the vehicle out of the impound lot confirming that the vehicle was not stolen and that he had given permission for its use. To be clear, this is not a criminal investigation in Youngboy's eyes yet. He's just giving permission for the vehicle to be taken back out. The slip up would arise when Youngboy believed he was on mute and he said, ask him about the prescription that they picked up. And then he paused and said, she on the effing hospital bed, she on the hospital bed. This utterance that Cantrell Galden made was to another person on the conference call that was later identified as associate number three, who was a lifelong friend of young boy. The pattern of the call going on mute in and out gave indication to the agent that young boy was trying to put him on mute while trying to communicate with his partner to get an update on the prescription that was picked up. They used this as evidence to support that young boy was influencing these associates to pick up the prescription for him under fraudulent pretense and they also made of note said that he used the word axe when he tried to say ask so they made that as a reference to the previous calls that he made to the pharmacies the agent would speak to the doctor and he would request the dopl records that were created by way of fraudulent prescriptions that were called in under his name this means that every single attempt that had been called in under his name was being handed over on record through the Utah government under their Division of Professional Licensing directly to the authorities. This is not good for young boy because this is a solidified paper trail. The physician would also mention that he had records of three other pharmacies that were using his name fraudulently. We can see that the affidavit begins to describe the successful pickups of the codeine serum. We begin with Ann White. That was the first fake name used where it was successfully picked up by a male individual who is referred to as Associate One. And then another by Beatrice White. This was picked up by Associate Number Two and Number One and also Associate Number Three on different dates. Another pickup occurred for Caroline White when the prescription was called in twice, first on September 21st and then on October 13th. The pattern will continue throughout the documents and you can see that the supply was for about eight days on average. To begin page six, we see that a prescription was picked up with only a social security number with no identification. And then we see another incident where a prescription was picked up twice for an eight day supply. One time on the 13th of September and another on the 14th of October. If we pay attention, those pickup dates are very close together from the other pharmacy pickups. As we continue on page six, it says that the information provided from the physician's office said it was of value to note that the age of the fake patients being used was between 40 and 50, suggesting that they are elderly and that they were using different combinations of the first and last names, just using different birthdays. The document also states that this only includes the DOPL transactions that were listed, which is the database that all licensed businesses have to input all their transactions on. Earlier on this page, we saw that one of the attempts was a minor that was picking up the prescription for Kentrell Galden. And then he was apprehended and he was handed over to his legal guardian by the drug task force. 
this is concerning because the prescription that he was trying to pick up was in young boy's real name Kentrell Golden but he was using a fake date of birth of 1953. At the bottom of page 6 we see that the elder narcotic strike force received a report of the juvenile attempting to pick up the fraudulent prescription for young boy with a fake birthday. This information was given for an additional prescription as well that was called in for more cough syrup for young boy. We can see at the top of page 7 that the provider used was out of Houston, Texas. So this opens the gates for federal charges to be placed on young boy as they're now trying to tie his illegal activity across state lines. This Houston, Texas physician information would come up when young boy was arrested at his home but we'll cover that in a little bit. Page 7 would recap some of the information we already covered and they do a follow up on the pullover that they did on the vehicle when they smelled the marijuana and they found the empty 1911 handgun box and they also mentioned that they noticed that same vehicle the white Chevy Tahoe. Another thing to note is that this same vehicle was used in a music video by young boy. Page 7 would also mention that this shows a pattern consistent with organizational structure identified in the fraudulent prescription documented in the DOPL report for the physician. When you start hearing other states being mentioned, when you start hearing structured, when you start hearing organizational, you start to think about a RICO, you start to think about other charges coming. So hopefully, Youngboy is prepared for a legal showdown because we certainly hope the best for Youngboy here on Blender Bars. But that's not the only part that makes me believe a Rico might be coming. On the page, it also says that Youngboy is a primary suspect of this investigation and that he's from Louisiana, but he's lived in multiple states to include Texas, Georgia, California, and Utah. And also that he's on federal pretrial probation awaiting trial for a federal gun charge for being a felon with possession of a firearm. We can also see that his criminal history is being introduced and the violent parts of his history are being highlighted. We see them mention two counts of murder that young boy was hit with in Louisiana in 2016 even though the charges were reduced. And then we see them mention another charge in Georgia for aggravated assault and kidnapping, even though those charges were reduced as well. We can clearly see that they're trying to paint a narrative that young boy is a violent menace to society. It becomes clear the federal government is involved as they mention the FBI arrested him for possession of a weapon by a felon, and that's why he's on federal pretrial. And it mentions that the FBI classifies young boy as a leader of the NBA street gang. The NBA street gang is a group of associates of Kentrell Golden that has been classified as a gang because of their structure, affiliation, and violent behavior. We also see them mention that his music promotes the behavior to shoot, kill people, use drugs, and have a strong dislike for law enforcement. To begin page 8, we see that they mention that he's currently residing in Weber County in the vicinity of Huntsville, Utah in a multi-million dollar home described as a mansion. We see them mention that he has to have a list of people that go in and out of his home and that Associate 3 mentioned in the paperwork that was confirmed to pick up fraudulent prescriptions is on that list. As we continue on page 8, we see that the pattern of unlawful behavior charges being justified, which is the RICO equivalent in Utah because they don't have a formal RICO charge. We can see them back up the claim when they say the ongoing fraud and suspected drug distribution occurring between Kentrell Golden and his associates further substantiates the pattern of unlawful activity as they have engaged in at least three episodes of unlawful activity that are all similar in purpose, results, participants, victims, and methods of commission. This sounds like they're setting the framework up for a federal RICO on young boy. Getting towards the bottom of page 8 is when we finally see the search warrant for young boy's home being submitted and the judge, the Honorable Craig Hall, signed the search warrant. And on April 16th, 
the search warrant was executed on young boy's home and he was advised of his Miranda rights. He acknowledged them and consented to participate in the interview. The paperwork mentions that other individuals were apprehended, but does not say who. During the interview, Youngboy was asked about the presence of firearms inside the home. He would say that a gun belonging to his wife was in the home. They asked him if he's ever handled a gun or if his DNA would appear on the weapon. He denied it. However, he would later mention that two days earlier, he had picked up the weapon and moved it from an open area and placed it inside of a drawer. He claimed that was the only time that he had touched the weapon. Youngboy would mention that his wife always has the weapon within her reach. Youngboy was asked about the presence of prescription medication in his home. He said that he has a prescription for the promethazine. He provided the doctor information when they asked him for it and he suggested it was a local doctor in the Roy area. They asked if he has a doctor from the Houston, Texas area and he said no. Remember, we mentioned earlier in the paperwork that the minor was involved in the scheme when he was using the information from the physician in Houston, Texas. So this link could cause young boy to catch federal charges. They will continue to ask questions about his associates picking up fraudulent prescriptions and he would deny any knowledge of their activities. He did confirm to have association with known associates one, two, and three. He also was confronted about the conference call where he spoke to one of the agents on January 24th and he claimed he did not remember. Young boy would try to imply that the authorities were likely speaking to his father but in the documents, it notes that Youngboy has a very distinct voice and they could easily distinguish his voice from his father's. Youngboy would keep getting questions asked, however, he continued to be deceptive and deny knowledge of any illegal activities and he said everything he possessed was legally prescribed and the interview was ended. The authorities would search Youngboy's home and the search would produce a prescription bottle of lean in young boy's master bedroom in the bathroom the bottle had caroline white's name on it which was one of the known fraudulent names and it also had the corresponding prescribing doctor who had confirmed the fraud they also found a prescription for doxycycline that he had fraudulently obtained they found that all this information matched up with the facts of their investigation then they also found another bottle with the label taken off then they came across a handgun in the closet of young boy they determined that the handgun had an empty magazine with one round in the chamber they mentioned that it was not in a secured location and in a place easily and frequently accessible to control gold the search would reveal that more bottles of lean were found and also the electronics were seized and they asked for the passcodes. However, Youngboy refused to give any passcodes for the devices. He answered, take it and break it when he was asked for the passcodes. He refused to provide further evidence. The authorities make it clear that the purpose for getting these devices is for suspicion of containing communications that will provide further evidence of the identified ongoing criminal enterprise and the criminal actions occurring therein. This is not good for young boy as the feds are making their intentions clear that they're looking for more evidence of the suspected criminal enterprise that young boy is in charge of which may lead to a federal RICO because they already said he's the head of the NBA gang. Young boy was placed under arrest and charged with identity fraud, forgery, and prescription fraud. Each count for each incident in the procurement and attempted procurement of the fraudulent prescriptions. This accounts for 18 confirmed successfully filled prescriptions and at least two confirmed attempts. It also mentions that he was charged for a pattern of unlawful conduct as the prescription fraud scheme contains numerous incidents over an extended duration of time. So that's like the state Rico in Utah. Young boy was then transported to the Cache County Jail to be booked on the appropriate offenses. The document will conclude by saying that young boy 
is participating in the ongoing criminal enterprise and he's been involved in the commission of multiple felonies and also he's the leader of a violent gang from the Louisiana area and based on his history he's prone to violence. They also mentioned that he admitted to handling a firearm two days prior to his arrest and they are requesting that he gets no bail because he was already out on a federal pre-trial release. Right, so if we do a quick recap, we can see that on top of the headlines that we all been reading, we can see that the state of Utah charged him with the RICO version that they have, titled Pattern of Unlawful Activity. We also heard that young boy was operating this fraud across state lines when he used the information of a doctor out of Houston, Texas. We also heard that a minor was involved in this drug operation, which may complicate the situation. We saw that the FBI is investigating Youngboy as the leader of a gang NBA that is responsible, according to them, to violence, drug distribution, and many more crimes. That was another Blender Bars banger. Subscribe if you haven't. I appreciate all the support. Comment down below if you think it's over for Youngboy or if he's going to have another legal victory in the courtroom. All right, nobody bigger than a chat. Click the screen for another video and stay tuned for the latest on the Grave Digger Mountain General. I'm out.